the, the question of how do we look at decarbonization both from an energy systems and a land perspective. We have a phenomenal panel. I'm going to first ask Claude Naon to join me. Claude is the executive vice president uh, for sustainable development at, uh, at EDF, which is uh, uh, one of the largest utilities, not just uh, in Europe, but in the world. Claude, if you would like to take any chair, maybe okay. put in the middle, please. In the middle, okay. That would be okay. great. great. Next, we have uh, Chad Frischman, who's the vice president and research director of Project Drawdown. Please, look. if you'd like, please sit down. Sure. I, I was waiting. But with then we have Chris Bataille, who is a researcher at the International Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations um, in France. Chris. And we will be joined um, shortly by Kate Gurry, who is the head of regulatory affairs of, um, of NL. Um, so let me uh, place myself here. The, the question we've had, we've had a lot of discussion around um, energy decarbonization, and it's, it's great to see that countries are, are, are really stepping up. Actually, there's a clarity of vision of what needs to be done, and though we are too slow and too late out of the blocks, um, the, trend, the train is definitely moving in the right direction. Something that is becoming increasingly clear, though, is the question of how do we, how do we relate to the land use side of it. Itself a big, a big question, we'll talk about that, but also how much of the decarbonization has to come from the land-based sector through negative emissions. So what's the relationship between the decarbonization on the energy side and, um, and the land use side? And so we'd like, to, we'd like to take a look at, ask our panelists to take a look at decarbonizing the energy system with a particular focus on the implications for the land use sector. Claude, if I may ask you to, to, to kick us off. So I, I, I will be first on, on that. Uh, this is a big issue. This is a big issue. If you just think of uh, decarbonizing, being carbon neutral by 2050, I don't think we are able to do it if we are not systemic. It cannot be just one sector. It has to be something we are doing together. So yes, I do believe that the question of land use is, uh, is, is in, in the middle. Land use in one hand, and also how are we using the land, which is not exactly, exactly uh, the same. Uh, when uh, you, you asked me to join this panel, I thought that maybe I could just give an example. Uh, an example that uh, uh, we are now uh, taking as a, as, as, as a goal, um, as it was announced at uh, our General Assembly, we are to develop in France 30 gigawatts of solar panel. So I'm sorry because I will, I will take European measurement, but that means that at least we need 30,000 uh, 30, uh, hectare to do it. But if we are serious, it's quite doubling. As a company, uh, we, we built a lot of hydropower. That means that we are an, uh, uh, owning a lot of land, but it will not be enough. If we are not thinking on how we are doing that, from the land use per perspective, I think we will miss something. If you just think of this question of developing 30 gigawatts in 15 euros, you have to think on what sort of solar panel we will have. I will say that we have three parts of it. They are not equal, but there are, there are different ways to take them in account. The first will be to develop self-consumption. We need people to have solar panels on their roof because it will reduce the impact on the soil and on, and, and on biodiversity. Uh, that means that we will have certainly to find a way to, to develop our subsidiary, which is already uh, a leader in, in, uh, in, in that and having a lot of, of demand. I will say that people are, uh, are they, they don't have to have, make any publicity. People want self-consumption, so we have to build on self-consumption. And uh, on the other hand, you will have big, big farms, solar farms. But we cannot build them everywhere. We have to be careful about uh, what we call artificialization of soil. That means that we have to reduce it because we cannot afford it. In Europe, it's not the US. We have not that, that much uh, room in, in the country to, to develop this sort of thing. So we have to use, I will say, still artificialized soil or to work with, with people that are owning that land. So that means that uh, we will have to, 
to develop strong relationship with agriculture, we will have to develop strong relationship with, with NGO working on biodiversity, because if we are not, there will not be, we are not to be able to develop this sort of, uh, of solar panel. So that means that, of course, we will have also to work on uh, public acceptance, and that means that we will develop more than we do today crowdfunding. No, or no, uh, not because it will be um, money that will be cheap, it will be money that will be much more uh, expensive than the money we can get on the market, but it will be a way to build public acceptance and make the people part of it. Because as a company, and I, 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 I want you to have that in mind, as a company, we were the one that builds the electricity sector in France. That means that we are engineer, we think, we do it, and we deliver electricity. This is done. This is not the way things can be do today. We have to work in another way. This way has to be uh, more collective, more systemic, as I mentioned. We have to take into account uh, different way people want to manage their energy and how we can enable that, which make a huge, huge, huge difference on how we... So this is also a way to leverage a change within the company because we are to build uh, this plan with, with people. We are not to be the owner of every plant. We are not to be uh, part of everything. We just want to be the one that enabled these 30 gigawatts in, in, in France. To, 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 to finish, I would just like to highlight also one point, which is biodiversity. This is also a, way, a question about saving carbon and sequestering carbon. We need to work on biodiversity. We know that we are able to build plants that are able to, to protect biodiversity. Uh, but at the same time, we, we dream to be uh, positive on biodiversity. That means that we believe that this sort of approach has to take into account uh, a development on biodiversity on, 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 the, on the place where we want to build this solar panel. And the third part of, of solar panel will be something with middle size panel. And maybe it could be interesting, we, we develop a, 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 an example which is for us uh, an innovation. Uh, we develop what we call, uh, I will try to translate in English, it's ombrière in French, but meaning that it's shadow, uh, shadow uh, roof that you can put on a, on a parking spot. And so you have, you have the sort of PV on the, on the roof and you have your car just behind, which is, uh, which is charging. And of course, we developed that on, in, in uh, one of uh, nuclear plants in the south of France. And of course, people find that very fun. So this is a, a, a way to utilize soil and uh, taking into account that we don't want to develop uh, solar PV everywhere and, and, and without taking into account this big issue of artificialization of, of soil, which is a, really a difficult one for us, for us in France. So I pointed this, this, this example because this is, for me, something that is our future. We have to have a systemic approach on each and every question regarding energy and, and especially uh, regarding sustainable energy. If we want to develop clean energy, we have to do it, having in mind that we have not only to do what I was mentioning about uh, land, but we have also to think that we need to develop maybe an industry which is European on, on solar PV. Uh, and that means that we have to think more globally. This is what, what companies have to do today. They are not only delivering partially electricity for, for in, in our case, it has something which is much more global and at the same time much more scrutinized by, by people. So we have to, to, to be able to, uh, not only to deliver, but, but to prove it. So it is a transforming time for us. It is an amazing, uh, an amazing one and, and we are very excited with that, but it has a lot of social consequences that we have to take into account also for our, for our people. So this is really, all round. So when you mention land, it's just a good example on how we are to transform our industry to another, to an industry which is much more closer, I think, to, to the, the community where, in which we are operating than it was by the past. 
And it's a, a different way for us. We explain that to our people, saying this is a different way to be a, a service public because we love that world in France, um, being, uh, being in, in charge of something which is uh, needed by, by people and delivering it in time. So this is very interesting. This is uh, new and land definitely will help us to re reinvent our relationship with uh, the community and the territory. Thank you. So this clearly is an illustration of how in a land constrained um, environment we even, even seemingly simple solutions like solar panels need to be looked at from a much broader perspective. Chad, project drawdowns, and please tell us a little bit about project drawdown. You're working on, on solutions, finding solutions, and tell us um, a little bit about the types of solutions you're seeing in the space. In particular, how do you, how do you look at the spillovers, how do you make sure that something that looks like a good solution really is a good solution that doesn't have unintended consequences elsewhere? Um, right. Um, well, uh, first of all, we collect a lot of data um, and information on these solutions from, from all over the world. Um, and we uh, assemble them in our models and, and, and our, as we conduct our research and, and uh, ensure that when we're looking at different types of solutions um, that they are uh, uh, we uh, evaluate all the different potential cascading benefits and positive and external externalities and negative externalities. Um, but that's, that's kind of just a quick answer to that. But since, since I have slides, I, I'm going to actually stand up if that's to, okay so I can yes. take a look and have a little bit of a presentation. So, <laughs> uh, thank you. So, um, drawdown. Uh, you may not have ever heard of that word before, but it's something that you might ought to know. Um, Drawdown is a new way of thinking about and acting on global warming. It's a goal for a, a future that we want, a, a future where reversing global warming is possible. Drawdown is that point in time when atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases begin to decline on a year-to-year -year basis. It's that point when we take out more greenhouse gases than we put into Earth's atmosphere. Now, climate change is a concern for us all, but climate change is really an expression of the problem. Climate change is the feedback of the system, of the planet, telling us what's going on. The problem is global warming, provoked by the increasing concentrations of greenhouse gases. So how do we solve the problem? How do we begin to reverse global warming? The only way we know how is to actually draw down to avoid putting greenhouse gases up and to pull down what's already there. Now I know given the current situation that sounds impossible, but humanity already knows what to do. We have the technologies and practices that can achieve drawdown and it's already happening. What we need to do is accelerate implementation and to change the discourse from one of fear and confusion which only leads to apathy, to one of understanding and possibility, and therefore opportunity. So I work for an organization called Project Drawdown, um, and together with a team of researchers and writers from all over the world, we've mapped, measured, and detailed 100 solutions to reversing global warming. 80 already exist today, and when taken together, those 80 can achieve drawdown. 20 are coming attractions. These are solutions on the pipeline. And when they come offline, we'll speed up our progress. And these, do, these solutions do one or more of three things. Replace existing fossil fuel-based energy, energy generation with clean, renewable sources. Reduce consumption through technological efficiency and behavior change. And to biosequester carbon in plants, biomass, and soils through a process we all know from grade school, the magic of photosynthesis. It's through a combination of these three mechanisms that drawdown becomes possible. So how do we get there? Well, this is a list of the top 20 solutions to reversing global warming. Now, it's an eclectic list I know, from onshore wind turbines to educating girls, from plant-rich diets to 
rooftop solar technology. So let's break it down a little bit. To, to the right of the slide, you'll see figures in gigatons. That's a billion tons. That represents the total equivalent carbon dioxide reduced from the atmosphere when the solutions are implemented globally over a 30-year period. Now, when we typically think about uh, uh, climate solutions, we think about electricity generation. We think about renewable energy as the most important set of solutions. But the first thing to notice about this list is that only five of the top 20 solutions relate to electricity. What surprised us, honestly, was that eight of the top 20 solutions relate to the food system. Now, the climate impact of food may come as a surprise, but what these results show us is that the decisions we make every day on what we produce, purchase, and consume are perhaps the most important contributions every individual can make every day to reversing global warming. But here's what's also quite interesting. Our research shows that when we implement all these solutions as a system, we would produce enough food on current farmland to feed the world's growing population a healthy, nutrient-rich diet now until 2050 and beyond without cutting down any new forest. The solutions to reversing global warming are the same solutions to food insecurity. And land management is also incredibly important. How we manage our, how we protect our uh, forests, wetlands, and how we manage currently degraded land safeguards, expands, and creates new carbon sinks that directly draw down carbon. This is drawdown in action every year as carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere through photosynthesis, which converts carbon dioxide to plants, biomass, and soil organic carbon. When we take land and food together, 12 of the top 20 solutions to reversing global warming relate to how and why we use land. This fundamentally shifts traditional thinking on climate solutions. Now, some solutions that don't often get talked about, I'm gonna mention them here, it's, they are actually very much related to energy and food, uh, let me skip ahead, uh, to educating girls and family planning. By providing men and women the right to choose when, how, and if to raise a family through reproductive health clinics and education, access to contraception, and freedom devoid of persecution can reduce the estimated global population by 2050. That reduction in population means a reduction in demand for electricity, food, buildings, and every other resource, all the energy and emissions that are associated with that higher demand are reduced by providing the basic human right to choose when, how, and if to raise a family. But family planning can't happen without equal quality of education to girls currently being denied access. So what we actually did here is take a little bit of liberty because the impact of universal education and family planning resources are inextricably intertwined. So we cut it right down the middle. But what this shows is when you combine educating girls and family planning, resolving the gender inequity is the number one solution to reversing global warming, reducing an estimated 120 gigatons over 30 years. So one last point, because I think it's on everybody's mind, how much is this all gonna cost? According to our analysis, um, Sorry, I'm running out of a bit of a time. Um, according to our analysis, this would cost an approximately $29 trillion over 30 years. That's roughly about a trillion dollars a year. Now, it's a lot, but when we think about global GDP of being over $80 trillion every year, it's really not that much. It doesn't cost that much to be implementing these solutions. And the estimated savings is over $74 trillion, over double the costs. That's a net savings of $44 trillion. So drawdown is possible. We can do it if we want to. It's not gonna cost that much, and the return on that investment is huge. But we need all 80 solutions to get there. The top solutions will take us far along that pathway, but there's no such thing as a small solution. We need all 80. But here's the great thing. 
We want these solutions, we want to implement these solutions, whether or not global warming was even a problem, because they all have cascading benefits to human and planetary well-being. Renewable energy generation results in clean, abundant access to energy for all. A plant-rich diet and reduced food waste results in a healthy global population with enough food and sustenance. Family planning and educating girls is about human rights and gender equality. It's about economic improvement and the freedom of choice. It's about justice. Regenerative agriculture, managed grazing, civil pasture, agroforestry. This restores soil health and productivity, improves water retention, benefits smallholder farmers and large farming operations alike, and brings carbon back to the land. Protecting our ecosystems protects biodiversity and safeguards planetary health. And the oxygen that we breathe, its tangible benefits to all species is incalculable. So it's possible to achieve drawdown, but it's gonna take a lot of action and work at a global scale to achieve it. But here's the welcome surprise. When we implement all of these solutions, we actually shift the way we do business from one that is inherently exploitative and extractive to a new normal that is, by nature, restorative and regenerative. We've done a great job in implementing the sustainable, or starting to think about and creating a pathway for the sustainable development goals. We also need to think what's beyond, what's beyond sustainability, and start thinking about regeneration. Because along the way, we can also reverse global warming. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chad. Very interesting. Chris, you've been working for many years now on deep decarbonization pathways. Can you explain to us what they are and um, what some of the lessons are that you've learned from your work in Canada and around the world? Sure. Okay. Well, sounds like everyone can hear me here. Um, so I've been looking at this for a little over 20 years at this point, and I'm an energy economist by training. Um, and the subject has forced me to look a little bit more broadly, think a little bit more, bring a few more things in. And I'm really happy I'm going behind Chad here because the, what I'm going to talk about is kind of, it's going to weave in, in and out of his results. And what I'm going to focus more on is how do we get this done? What, what are the policies we need? What, what are the things that are going to push us in, into a different system from where we are right now? Um, so. To, I'm gonna, there's three phases to what I'm going to talk about. I've got some bad news, I've got some good news, and more bad news, but then there's a fourth phase, which is I've some thoughts of where we go on from here. Now, the bad news is that we're all, we, climate change is not something speculative. It, it's, I'm from Canada. Um, in the northern latitudes, it's plainly obvious it's happening. I'm from British Columbia. My province has been on fire for two summers. Um, we have a family cottage. My wife has a family cottage in Nova Scotia. Literally, the ocean is eating the property. Okay? Uh, so this is, this is something that's extremely personal and real to me. So I've seen one, in my lifetime, it's gone up one sea. In my children's lifetime, in my children's lifetime, it's likely to go up to one, two or three, even three C if we don't change course. However, there, there is hope, there is structural policy hope here. Um, the Paris Agreement's aspirations are that we hold the increase well below 2C, heading towards one and a half. However, the means of the Paris Agreement, which is the nationally determined contributions, which are actually supposed to be actualized through national policies, if they were all perfectly implemented and stacked up, would get us to about plus 2.7 C. So we, we need, a, debt, we need a, a, a grand tightening of policy ambition if we're going to match our rhetoric here. So that's, a bad, that's the first wave of bad news. The good news is, as Chad was just talking about, we know how to do this. There are technological and process options to basically carbonize everything that human beings do. One, one way or the other. 
Um, between build transport, buildings, industry, I've spent two years working on how, how do you decarbonize steel, cement, chemicals, what have you, um, what, and, and land use. And uh, two weeks ago in, in San Francisco at the Global Climate Action Summit, SDSN held their Low Emission Solutions Conference. I'm going to kind of weave in through some of their results. Uh, to quote Dr. Margaret Tarn, she was one of the org organizers of that conference, for any of our climate goals, we must not only eliminate emissions from the energy system, we must repair, preserve, and enhance the land emission sink. And what that means is, is that we have to completely change how we relate to the, to the global land base. We have to allow it to come back into its more natural mode of taking down carbon from the atmosphere, not putting it up, not putting it up, up into the atmosphere. It's about a third of what's added into the atmosphere each year at this point in time. Now, you probably heard a lot of stuff about energy, as, as uh, Guido was saying. And you know, the first, the first and easiest thing is to be more efficient. If you want, we've got to be dramatically more efficient, at least 50% across the board. And it's not just our traditional way of thinking about efficiency, but it's moving more towards a principle of what we call circular economy. So it's, you know, we design things better. We design them to last longer. When they do finally wear out, we design them so that they can be recycled and the materials can go back through the system much more easily. We very much have a system right now where we take raw materials, we put it through a productive system, we contaminate those materials in the process, and then we're living with, the, we're living with waste that's just not that useful afterwards. So that whole, that whole system has to, has to change. But more than that, and this is where things get hard, this, that's the easy stuff, dealing with the energy system, material system. We need to learn as a global society to manage land. Like currently, we're still living with a very old paradigm of land where it, you know, nature gets torn out, you, you, you move in, you build something there, and that's, that's how you adjust it. And there's still this concept of wilderness. It's not thought of basic, it's our basic, it's, uh, it's a support system that keeps us all alive one, one way or the other. Um, yeah, and this, to be honest, I think this is going to be one of the great tasks, one of the great occupations of, of basically from 2050 on, basically out into foreseeable human history. It's a closed planet, and the people who will be doing that will be will very up, high up in our organizational food chains. Um, now, and this is, this is where things get a little dicey, and, and with more uncertainty, given how much carbon we've dumped into the atmosphere and has been taken up in the oceans and resulting in acidification, is we're gonna to have to engage some technological negative emissions processes. And this is where the nexus with the land gets really tight in that the one process we know will work is that we burn woody biomass, we take that waste and put it underground using carbon capture and storage. It works but it's gonna come directly into conflict with our food needs, with our biodiversity needs, what have you. And how we balance that, nobody's done that before. We know it can be done, but nobody's gotten into the deep politics of how do, you, how, how do we do that. Um, so the bad news, again, more, <laughs> sorry, is we're having, like, we've got all these options. We're just having a lot of difficulty implementing policy to drive, to drive them, to make them happen. And frankly, I think it's because we're approaching it from an ad hoc perspective, focusing on costs and not benefits. Anybody starts talking about climate policy, cap and trade, oh, it's going to be half a percent of two GDP, 1%, 2% of GDP. We're not focusing on the benefits. More than enough studies have come out that just the air quality benefits alone will pay for a limit for cleaning up the energy system for cleaning up the transport system and to great positive benefit to people mainly in the developing world mainly in large cities um, we're going to need to focus at the national state and city levels we're going to have to create realistic transition plans and fulsome integrated uh, policy packages that work with not against national development goals. The moment climate policy comes in collision with economic development, climate policy loses. This is what happens everywhere. Um, that the two things have to come together and we need to reframe climate policy not as this environmental add-on, but security. It's a secu it's, it is a security issue. Taken to its nth degree, given the water, land, agriculture, and like agriculture impacts of going to 2C and beyond, it's likely to generate the largest refugee crisis in human history. It makes, it'll make Syria look like something on TV. 
okay? Um, and so it needs to come right to the top. It can't be the fifth and ninth thing that we consider. Uh, and frankly, it's not rocket science, but real hard, serious, uh, real politic work. So in order to get this done, every jurisdiction needs to declare itself for net zero emissions. Not minus 50%, not minus 80%, but net zero. And by 2060 to 2070, within the lifetimes of most people in this room, it needs to be something that we will all see for it to be effective. Um, and there are places that are doing this. California has brought in their executive order at GCAS. New Zealand has announced this. And it needs not just to be a goal, um, but something that is, produced, that is pursued with zeal. Okay, so New Zealand, uh, sorry, uh, Costa Rica, the United Kingdom, New York, New England, the C40 cities, they're all, they've all brought in thoughtful policy packages to, to bring on physical decarbonization. Now, these policy packages, they're every, it's going to be different for everywhere. They're going to have to be effective at what they do. They're going to have to use the least, co least resources possible, which is why economists push carbon pricing. But again, carbon pricing sometimes not politically effective, which pushes us back into to regulations. But most important, and this is, this is where the consideration of the national political context comes in, they have to, these policies have to anticipate the needs, the potential opposition of the actors who need to actually implement those actions and might block it. If you don't think about who this is going to hurt, they're gonna come, they're gonna stop you. They will, and I, I've literally seen almost three cap and trade systems in Canada fail because the, the industries that were most effective, and they were not that big from employment level, or even, uh, even a GDP level, they came out hard because they felt threatened. If this is gonna work, they have to be in the conversation to begin with, and they're gonna need the help with innovation and, and transition. In order, such that they don't, they come out full in opposition against you. So you're gonna to have to bring in your governments, your communities, indigenous peoples, firms, labor, environmental organizations, civil society. They all have to have a buy-in to the transition plan. Uh, again, we're gonna need a whole suite of things. It's gonna depend on the context, regulations, carbon pricing. Um, it's gonna, it depends on the actor. For, for innovation responds really well to pricing. Firms respond well to pricing. Household, households in the transport and building sector don't. You might as well just put a regulation on the sectors because you can put carbon pricing to the roof and they will not change. Um, and you're going to need institutions to support all the above and especially an, an oversight institution that measures project progress and adjusts policy if necessary. Um, yeah, I'll... So anyway, to, to come around to this, the net zero goal is, fundament, is fundamental to making this, this happen and is being part of the conversation. I'm from Canada, I'm sure you've heard of our endless discussions about pipelines, oil sands, what have you, and how they've spilled over into the discussion down here. But frankly, I think the reason we've been struggling with understanding the tr transition away from oil production, despite the relatively green nature of our culture, is that we, we haven't been given a, cre a real frame. Our oil and gas industry, which has invaluable industrial chemical knowledge for the net zero transition, it, ne it needs a clear investment horizon. It needs firm regulatory signaling as to what it needs to achieve over the coming decades. So to summarize, uh, there are clouds on the horizon, but there's also hope. We have lots of examples of good policy occurring around the world, uh, things, that, things that we can copy and experiment with. And dis despite the clouds we're dealing with, I, I'm going to choose to believe and follow that hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for weaving all these pieces together. I think that's, it's really critical. We need the technical solutions that Chad has outlined. We need to think about the trade-offs that uh, Claude has emphasized, but really weave it together, not just in analysis, but also in a framework for engaging the different partners in, in society. Katie Gary, thank you so much for braving New York traffic uh, on this day. Uh, thanks to Enno for the partnership um, in, uh, in developing the Low Emission Solutions Conference. You're head of regulatory affairs here in North America. What is your perspective on the question of decarbonizing the energy system and to what extent is Enel considering land use as part of this strategy? To what extent does this play into your day-to-day -day strategy and operations? 
So, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, apologies for the delay in my arrival. Amtrak and the West Side Highway and NYPD had other ideas on my arrival. Uh, yes, I'm Katie Geary. I am head of regulatory affairs in North America for NLX. NLX is one of the business lines of NL Group that is active here in North America. My other job is I am a mom of three young girls. Um, I'd like to mention that. My team um, is actually in the middle of it where the rubber hits the road. We handle regulatory advocacy on behalf of NLX at the wholesale level for, in federal jurisdiction and at the retail level at state jurisdiction. So we are in front of regulatory bodies and agencies arguing for proper energy and environmental policy. Where we focus on in an LX is uh, the customer end of the spectrum. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on myself, I've been in the energy industry for about 15 years. I started off at an oil company. Some of you may know Hess. Um, at the time, it was Amarada Hess. It was a while ago. Um, I've dealt in all different commodities, natural gas, electricity, fuel oil products, um, and now demand response, which has been the focus of my efforts over the past five years. As I said, I'm the head of regulatory affairs for NLX North America, but that's actually technically occurring on Monday. For the past five years, I have been in the same role, but I've been working for a company called Enernoc. We have been the global leader for demand response. The reason why I am up on this panel is because of that proliferation of demand response um, that we have helped incentivize worldwide, but particularly here in North America. Um, so what is demand response? What our company does is we work with commercial and industrial customers to accomplish what was just referenced, um, identifying better processes, greater efficiencies, new technology that can be utilized at customer sites to better use and purchase their energy needs. Demand Response with the capital D and a capital R is a program or service for which our customers get paid to do one of the best things in relieving the stress on the energy grid, which is to turn their electricity off or to turn it to something else. These are typically in situations of emergency or grid stress, such as a line tripping or a generator going out, such as which happened several years ago um, in something called the polar vortex. Typically, it's been seen as a summer product where system uh, conditions reach peak conditions. Um, over the past several years, we have demand response, I should say, has been a resource that has led to the, fortunately, led to the retirement of some very unnecessary, very inefficient, very dirty peaking generation systems across the United States. So demand response has been a direct way for customers to engage in the markets and effectuate change on emissions in, the nor in North America. So why does my description of Enernoc and what we do with demand response and what with our customers matter for this panel? Um, and how does it play into why NLX bought us? And that's one of the questions posed here is does the utility business model need to change? Um, and NL Group's purchase of Enernoc is exactly um, what needs to happen with the utility business model. And L Group, for those of you who are not familiar, my bosses have told me we are the largest utility that you've never heard of. We're up here, so now you have heard of us. Um, in North America, um, the NLX business line is relatively new. Uh, we have been active here for several years as egp &A. We are a renewable developer um, and operator. Um, we have wind and solar and hydro assets across North America. Green Power is an, a global company, but we have a rather healthy footprint in North America. Um, we also have a division called Thermal Generation, which has historically housed Enel's fossil units. We have self-imposed retirement deadlines on ourselves um, for uh, coal assets in our fleet uh, uh, globally. Um, and interestingly, what we are doing with that thermal business unit is we are replacing it with storage resources. They're not thermal, but that is what is going to happen in the markets as we evolve away from these thermal resources. What do we need in order to move toward renewable resources? Storage is the key. When I started in the energy industry 15 years ago, one of the reasons I was told the electric market was the way that it was and it wasn't like the natural gas market is because you can't store electricity. It's constantly moving. 
that has changed. And that has been a phenomenal technology change that is going to facilitate increased transition over to renewable resources. So I said, Enel has uh, a mentality toward their utilities. They're very forward thinking. They recognize that the old system of lots of wires, distributing power from very large central and often dirty uh, generation plants is not what is going to happen in the future. What we're going to see is a lot more distributed resources across the system. Now in the instance of renewable resources such as solar and such as wind, which my company does develop, those are wonderful, they're renewable, they're clean. An issue for the system operators with those resources is that they are variable. They are at times unpredictable, although the ability to predict the output of those resources is increasing. The reality is that the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. So it's been very difficult to integrate those resources into the wholesale mar energy markets in an effective way from an economic perspective as it pertains to other generation resources that we may not need anymore but that are still sticking around. The reason why demand response is important it is because it is allowing customers to meet the variability needs that are occurring on the system from these renewable resources. And that is becoming even more possible with the reality of storage. And now, as I said, Enel Group has a business line focused on storage. The idea is it's going to re replace our thermal business fleet. Um, at Enel X, and so those are front of meter resources, very large, where we can store electricity on the system. Or in some instances, at a solar or at a wind facility, which is phenomenal. Um, at a customer level from Enel X's perspective, we view demand response as somewhat of a gateway drug, if you will, in the energy industry. Customers get paid to reduce or to eliminate their electric consumption. That's not political, that is a massive economic driver. And what we have found with customers is, interestingly enough, when you pay them to pay attention to their energy consumption, they become more engaged, they become more intelligent, and now they have money that they can reinvest in their companies, and they can reinvest in greater energy efficiencies. Just as to give you an example, one cold storage unit customer that we worked with, in going into their system and identifying efficiencies and adjusting when they used their electricity, overall they actually started using more electricity, but their costs were going down and they were using at times when the system was less stressed, which is putting less pressure on the dirtier, older generation plants. So, Enel X, um, as I said, um, is part of the transitioning business model that Enel has worldwide. It is taking our um, internal utility wires and generation development experience and translating that to the customer level. The key component to all of this is going to be digitization. We cannot connect all of these moving pieces and all of this increasing engagement and intelligence at the customer level without the technology to support it and to communicate that information. I have to tell you that I feel like I'm at a very exciting time in doing what I do in this field. As I said, I started off working for an oil company. I do something very, very different now and it is very exciting. It is very politically driven. Um, it can be at times very aggressive. There are incumbent economic and job interests of companies in this country that are real and that do need to be considered and that is why we believe demand response um, and the utilization of DERs, distributed energy resources at customer locations, is so key to facilitating the transition over to a low emissions world. Uh, I think I've covered the majority of the topics that That's I wanted great. to cover That's great. Thank there. you. What I, what I take away from what really all of you have said is that we have, the, we have the solutions on the energy side, but there clearly are massive design challenges and design in a broader sense of understanding the trade-offs, unintended consequences of getting a, politi a shared political vision and of implementing these challenges, even at the business level. 
Let me maybe just in closing just share another design challenge that, um, that we at the SCSN have been working on. With Chris, we've been fortunate to work on the energy pathways for deep decarbonization. There's, of course, the question of what do you do on the land use side. Let me just share two, two examples that we have encountered. There's, there's one very large country that has recently instituted a large-scale biofuel policy in order to increase incomes for farmers, but also to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, you would think that that policy would have been looked at also from a food security perspective, from a water perspective, from a biodiversity perspective, and other challenges on the land use sector, but that wasn't the case because the country actually lacks the capability to even to ask these questions quantitatively and to, and to see if we do this, what might happen. Take another country, a very a much smaller country, highly developed country, had a very stable land use management system, and all of a sudden that got completely upended because one of its major bilateral trading partner started to import very large volumes of dairy products. So dairy, the dairy industry literally exploded and had a lot of massive negative implications on land use and completely changed their trajectories on, um, on future um, emission reductions. And I mention this because we're, we're, we're at Columbia University, we're one of, the, one of the world's leading universities, and this is these are just two of, and I could, I could give many more indications of how we're currently designing and developing policies at the national level without even a solid understanding, a solid, uh, a rigorous analysis of what the implications might be. We're literally flying blind on some of these things. So the solutions are there, but we're just not putting them together. And that's why um, we at the SCSN with many partners have, have launched a, a new initiative that's basically the sister initiative to the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project we call it FABLE, FABLE Pathways for Food, Agriculture, Biodiversity, Land Use, and Energy. And one of, the, one of the earliest findings there is that the projected demands on the land sector in terms of negative emissions, because you might know that the IPCC pathways, the official pathways towards uh, decarbonization, almost all of them assume that the land sector will generate large scale what's called negative emissions. So you grow the trees, you cut them down, you burn them, you sequester the CO2, well, you capture the CO2 that comes out of it and you sequester it in the soil, so you, so you, you see actually remove CO2 from the, from the atmosphere. And we're seeing no shred of evidence that this is feasible at any significant scale. So that's just another, uh, another indication of, another illustration of the kind of complex design challenges that we need to solve. And if you're, if you're a student um, with, an, with the intention of, or with an interest in these issues, I can really not think of any more exciting field, both on the energy side, so the NL, um, NLX and, uh, um, and uh, the experiences from, um, from EDF and others illustrate this, but also on the land use system side. So we really need to apply a lot more knowledge at these, um, at these challenges. We run a little bit out of time, so we don't have time for, for questions. I would like to thank um, the panelists um, wholeheartedly for, this, for, this, for sharing these, these very exciting um, experiences. And I'm afraid I cannot read what I am supposed to do there now. This is, uh, um, and of course, I would like, to, would like to welcome Professor Jeffrey Sachs to join us here on the podium. Thank you. Thanks to the panel for an absolutely wonderful discussion. And we have a very exciting afternoon ahead, so please, uh, Stay uh, with us, and uh, we're going to be hearing from the president of Costa Rica shortly, which will be also uh, a, a great benefit for us. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists for the, the wisdom and um, try to summarize very briefly what I think are key, key takeaways uh, and key, uh, uh, key points, uh, pointers for us. There is broad agreement we need to get to net zero greenhouse emissions very soon and essentially by mid-century. So decarbonizing the energy system and changing land use patterns so we get to net zero and perhaps in the future even net negative uh, shortly is, uh, is key and I think broadly agreed. Second, to do that requires uh, two prongs the energy systems change and the land use systems change. Both of those are uh, significant transformations. They have to be done much faster than what would normally be considered uh, manageable because our backs are to the wall. 
Uh, we've gone on for so long and so slowly in addressing this crisis that in order to honor uh, the, they're not even safe limits anymore, but the limits that are uh, at least potentially manageably, manageable, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement targets, we need to move now absolutely dramatically. Third, these are systems. They are not individual items. And while there are many individual things that one can do, they will only work in the context of systems. And one can't even choose from a column individually and say, I'll do this, 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 and this, because the pieces might not fit together, or it makes no sense to add up individual items that way. And it, a classic example of this is that you may see cited many times converting to electric vehicles doesn't make sense because you actually end up through the electricity generation generating as much CO2 as you do from an internal combustion engine. This is an example of non-systems thinking because we need to convert both to EVs or some equivalent and the power generation together because that's the combination that gets you down to zero. So taking just one item in the column won't answer the question. And if you just make a list, you'll double count many things also because you'll get more credit than uh, one deserves because there are many overlaps in uh, individual items that in a systems manner would not be simply additive. So we need systems. And I think uh, to make systems change, we need planning. Uh, fortunately, utilities do planning. Uh, politicians don't do planning, but utilities do planning. And so it's typical for a utility to have to look ahead in 20 years. But typically, utilities in this country and in most countries have looked ahead only with regard to one item, which is can we meet capacity? Can we meet peak capacity? Can we be reliable without uh, brownouts or blackouts? But that's not the question anymore. The question is, how do we change the system to meet what will be the needs, but with decarbonization? But that's a planning problem, fundamentally. It's not a market problem, fundamentally. It's how to implement a system that can make this work. Of course, there are companies uh, in the midst of this, uh, and uh, they need to make a profit, and our utilities uh, have uh, even legally scorecards and benchmarking. Uh, you have to provide the lowest cost energy and so forth. These are antiquated ideas, but they are on the books. And so one needs patch-ups, carbon pricing, and other solutions in order to make these systems changes work in an effective manner. And this, again, requires a comprehensive uh, view. It also will require a change of the standard operating procedures. All systems have SOPs, and SOBs, by the way, uh, but they have SOPs. They have standard operating procedures. And we need to rewrite the rules. And that's what NLX was saying right now, is you're helping the companies rewrite the rules of how their standard operating procedures work, their business models. It's even more complicated now because the usual assumption that you're either a buyer or a uh, supplier of energy no longer applies. In modern technology, you can be on both sides. The idea that you have a certain diurnal cycle of energy no longer applies because you can shift forward uh, or backward during the day with sophisticated Internet of Things technologies to be shifting peaks and changing uh, diurnal or even seasonal patterns uh, of energy through smart use. One more point that I would say is this planning is more complicated than usual because it needs to be done on a regional scale even a global scale. Uh, regional, by that I mean the U.S. cannot solve its energy problem without cooperating with, China, with uh, Canada and with Mexico. The U.S. Northeast requires Canadian hydropower as its best solution. We need uh, 
high voltage direct current to carry power from hydro uh, in, uh, in uh, Quebec uh, down to uh, the U.S., but we can also use the same lines to uh, carry excess wind power from the U.S. Northeast to pumped hydro storage in Canada. The point is regional integration is key. Countries that don't even deal with each other very much right now, India and Pakistan, if they got together could have hugely beneficial uh, energy systems resolution by joining together. China has an even bolder vision, which they call GEI, Global Energy Interconnection, which is to connect the whole world's re uh, renewable energy uh, through long distance, low loss transmission. So I think the point is we need the engineers, we need first class technology, we need planning, we need to understand what our specs are of this system, which is to get down to zero by 2050, and then we can put the support structure of pricing and regulation into that in order to make this work. I think I would take that as the gist of what we've uh, heard today. As uh, Guido said uh, just now, we need students to do the work. So all over the world, get out your notebooks, get out your computers, start making the plans to 2050. Thank you.